Hi, welcome. Um, we know that we're standing between you and a party, so we'll get underway. Um, for this session, we're talking about optimizing MySQL performance with ZFS. And uh, so this will be a joint presentation between me, my name is Alan Packer, and uh, this is Neil Nagger. So just by way of background, the, the two of us, you don't need to see our pictures because you can see the real thing. Um, we work for a group within Sun Microsystems called um, Performance Technologies. And uh, for the last year and a bit, we've been part of the, um, the MySQL performance and scalability team within Performance Technologies, working with some of the MySQL folks. So what we've been working on in the recent past is getting uh, 5.4 out the door with the, the performance features. Um, but part of the exercise has been to do some work with, with ZFS and quite a bit of the testing, quite a few of the test environments we use have used that. So um, I'll be giving the introduction and then handing over to Neil. I need to make it completely clear that, that Neil is the rock star when it comes to ZFS performance and ZFS on uh, databases and I'm the trained monkey so um, I'm just here to give you the intro and then you get all the good stuff from Neil. <coughs> so ZFS is a fairly recent development in the grand scheme of things and I guess the importance of that is that file systems grew up many years ago um, initially on single disks that were fairly small capacity and then as people started using multiple disks there had to be some way of of getting the file system across multiple disks so volume managers were born and uh, it was pretty kludgy the way it worked and in the end entire industries were spawned. Um, some of you, how many of you have actually used Veritas volume manager in the past? I mean it's just a horrible nightmare. I, I used it a lot and you, you'll remember um, volumes, plexes and sub disks and trying to figure out what the heck's going on with it is just amazing. Um, and the thing is you had to do a lot of work to make sure that everything was striped over the available disks and you got everything right, otherwise you'd get into all kinds of trouble. And there were limits, lots of limits built in. And um, really what ZFS was, was an attempt to say, let's start again from scratch. We're in a different era and let's design a file system that does not have any limits. And really speaking, it, it doesn't have any limits either and one that can make intelligent use of um, the available resources that are out there. Part of uh, ZFS <coughs> being part of uh, Solaris was open sourced and so there's a whole bunch of patterns out there available. Now one of the common questions is does ZFS run on Linux and the answer sadly for Linux users is no. And the reason for that is that uh, the GPL is, uh, is not compatible with the license that's being used here. So anything that's BSD-ish or, or you know, Apache-ish in, in terms of licenses can go grab this, which is why you see it on, on uh, Mac OS and, and it's heading on to FreeBSD. But um, if you're on the GPL, it's a bit tougher. And so that's why <coughs> someone's put together a user-based implementation of ZFS, which is what the Fuse thing is. I'm not really sure what the status of that is. Um, so what are the core features of ZFS? Really there's, there's four um, main aspects of it. One is the data integrity, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail. But it's just very key that uh, you can't lose data through corruption with ZFS in the way you can with other file systems. Um, and that's, that's a really important issue because data is pretty important to people and uh, having it corrupted without you even knowing it is not a good thing. Um, there's immense capacity. As I said, it was designed to not have any limits. There, however long the world runs, we're not going to run into the limit of ZFS in any of the areas in which it was designed. You, you could have colossal capacity. It just dwarfs anything else that's out there by a very, very large margin. So it's, the, the, real, the limits were made unrealistically large, basically. Um, and that's at, at every level. It's not just the size of a file or the size of a file system, etc. Another of the key features of it is simple admin. And 
those of you who use any, I mean, I've used volume managers on multiple platforms from, from Linux through to Solaris and then Veritas, etc. There isn't anything that's as easy to do as ZFS um, from an admin point of view. It's just a really great development there. And then, of course, there's the issue of performance. Uh, it's designed for performance. That doesn't mean there aren't any performance challenges, um, particularly if you're talking about a... Um, that's not me, is it? No. <laughs> um, particularly uh, if you're talking about a very heavy I.O. scenario. So it depends a lot on what your environment is, but um, for the most part, it's, uh, you can run out of the box without, uh, without issues. But certainly in a database environment, there are some things to talk about, and Neil will be walking us through those. <coughs> <clears throat> so, looking a bit more at the design principles, what you do is you create pools with disks, and a, a pool, a ZFS pool, is almost to disks what a, uh, the VM is to memory. Um, simple to create, you just give it a bunch of disks, tell it whether they're mirrored and, and what have you, and it just goes and organises them itself. Um, I've mentioned the end-to-end -end data integrity, and really any alternative to full data integrity is, is problematic in an environment where your data matters to you. And we'll come back to that. And everything's transactional, so always consistent on disk. You don't have to worry about I.O. order. Um, we probably haven't got uh, time to go into the details of how this works, but um, there's, there's the ZFS intent log, stuff is shoved out to that and then um, things are written out as and when needed. Um, it's a different design, but think database transactions is, is the way to, to view it. One of the really different things about ZFS that takes a bit of getting your head around is the fact that you're not overwriting blocks ever. You're always doing a copy on write, so the original blocks are left in place and you're just uh, writing to, to new blocks, which means one of the implications of that is it turns your writes to disk into uh, sequential writes for the most part because you just batch a whole bunch of stuff up, shove it on the end, and then they get linked in. And one of the other nice things about the, the copy on write is you've always got a consistent state. No more FSCK. You just don't have FSCK. You never need to do it ever. Um, that's kind of cool. It's nice when booting up to never have to worry about that. Everything is set up as a tree of blocks with a Uber block at the top uh, pointing down to it. Um, transactions then happen, copy on write, um, and then the last thing that happens is a Uber block, block is rewritten, um, which is also copy on write, and you get checksums throughout. So, so what does that look like in practice? So this first one here is just a tree of uh, uh, pointers. You've got the, the data blocks down the, uh, the bottom and the the metadata up above. When you go and change some data, now that's the green things, you go and write some new blocks. And as I said, you're not overwriting, you're just doing a copy on write to a new area of disk. And then you have to go and, and change the, uh, the meta, uh, uh, metadata blocks, so they get put in as well. And then the last thing of all is you go and write a new Uber block. So um, the original stuff is still in place, you've now got the old ones out there and they can now be flushed out to be reused. But you can see immediately from this scenario how easy it is to create a snapshot because you've got the old tree with its old Uber block and all the pointers out there and so if you decide that you don't want to get rid of that, you'd really like to refer back to it, you just create a snapshot. And it turns out creating a snapshot is actually cheaper than throwing the blocks away because you now no longer have to return them to the free list. So now you've ended up with your new Uber block and, and pointing to the data and the old one so you can get at the data from either the old way or the new way. Pretty straightforward. And this is one of the very cool things, creating snapshots and then creating clones. Um, it's, it's one of the really useful features. I mentioned the end-to-end -end checksums. The old approach, if you're using checksums is to store the checksum with the data. The trouble is that doesn't protect you from all kinds of errors. Um, if there's an error, for example, in your uh, device driver, um, if there's some random errors that, that um, unhappily happen to uh, corrupt in such a way that the checksum doesn't catch it, you, you can end up with problems. 
What happens with ZFS though is at each level of the data you have a checksum that's not actually held with the data. So the checksum for the data block is actually held with the uh, indirect block and that, that in turn is checksummed higher up the list. The only one that has the checksum with the actual block is the Uber block. Um, so what that means is that you protect it right down the line from any, any kind of corruption at all. So let's look at what that means in practice. Traditionally, if you have a mirror, you've got your application mirroring down to the disk and somehow or other, and just to put this in perspective, someone did an exercise one time where they had a whole bunch of systems in a lab and they just uh, deliberately decided to check on, on uh, uh, corruption, silent corruption. So they set some stuff running for three weeks, I think it was, and at the end of the three weeks they found there were over 150 um, silent data corruptions on the disk, undetectable by normal means. That's pretty scary stuff. But anyway, what happens here, somehow or other we've got a corruption on the disk, one of the disks that's mirrored. And if we unluckily read from the bad one, um, then that's going to take it back up to the file system. If it's a metadata block, we'll get a file system panic. If it's a data block, we'll just have corrupted data. Now, it turns out we had a good data uh, block there, but we didn't know that it was good and the other one was bad. And then what happens is if we change that data and it gets flushed back out again, now we've got two bad copies because we've just overwritten the good copy as well. Oops. What happens with ZFS, though, is when it goes to read the data, it says, hang on a second, this is bogus because the checksum's wrong at the next level up. So it knows that there's a mirror copy. It goes and checks that and says, yes, this, this is okay. So it grabs the good copy and then it goes and corrects the bad copy. So as long as you mirror it, you get self-healing data. And you can also have scrubbing happening at the same time as well so that... Um, uh, so that it just goes quietly in the background and fixes the, the uh, bad blocks as and when it finds them for you. And this all works too. This is, this is not slideware. I mean, this has been out there for quite a long time. A lot of people use it. How many people do use ZFS here? Actually, someone asked earlier, does it work only on Open Solaris or also on Solaris 10? It, it works and it's supported on both. Uh, any Solaris from 10 onwards, it's supported on. Now this is an example I mentioned earlier about the ease of admin. Um, this is Solaris Volume Manager, which you know it's a bit tough to pick on it because frankly um, <laughs> Veritas Volume Manager is worse than this. Um, in fact, those of you who've used Veritas Volume Manager, there were so many VX commands that they ended up creating a VX Assist command, which was kind of a wrapper over the top of a whole lot of other commands underneath. It's just horrible. But anyway, under this scenario, what we're doing is we're going, we're taking a couple of disks, making a mirror, um, and then we're going and creating three file systems, and we're adding some more disks, grow, doing a GrowFS, etc. Some of the commands have actually been cut out here, but this is what you're faced with, and this is what you do in ZFS. You basically, there's two commands: there's a zpool command which manages your pools, and there's the ZFS which manages your ZFS file systems. So we create the pool called home, we're mirroring it with two disks which we name, and then we create three file systems, um, and we give them a mount point, and then finally we decide we want to add more space to the home pool, so we just say Z pool add home another mirror with a couple more disks, and you're done. It's that simple. So, over to Neil for the performance information. Oops.
So let's see about what are all the important uh, performance features that we have. Uh, it's it's nice to have a, re a really good file system, but it should really be fast for it to be to be uh, useful. So as Alan mentioned, this is a completely new redesign of a file system. What what Sun has taken is the concept of virtual memory management and and applied it to disks. So for example, you can add new disks on the fly. Just like you add memory to your machine, there's, there's no need to reinstall the OS. So here you can add a disk and there's no need to re, uh, recreate your FS, uh, transfer the old files to the new uh, volume, etc. Uh, the concept is taken so far as to actually we have uh, the block allocation algorithm used is a variant of the memory al uh, allocation algorithm that we, we use. So it's, it's fairly uh, good in the sense that you start off with a small number of disks, you can add more disks as you want more bandwidth or uh, uh, storage. The other uh, feature is, so when you do writes in ZFS or any other file system, you're, what you're doing basically is writing to memory. But the whole copy and write uh, paradigm actually makes it such a way that we can choose where to write these blocks. So when you're actually flushing these uh, blocks to disk, we choose to uh, we choose to allocate s s sequential blocks, and we can write at the speed of the disk, and that's really really fast. Uh, the third uh, nice thing about it is prefetch. Uh, most file systems in, uh, will implement prefetch, but uh, we have taken it to, uh, 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 it's much more greatly advanced. So what we have is we have prefetch, which it will find out whether you're doing uh, reads in a s -s 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 sequential order or you're going back. <coughs> we can also find out whether you're do, doing strided reads, uh, forward or back. So for example, you could read block 100, 200, 300, so it will uh, find out that, okay, I need to get block 400 and it will go and fetch block 400. Uh, these reads are also uh, stream based. So for example, if three of you are watching a movie, it will know that person A is at time <coughs> one minute, person B is at time 45 minutes, and the person C is at time uh, one hour, and it will prefetch for all three of them. So it's, it's a fairly intelligent uh, prefetch algorithm. Uh, but as but you'll see more about prefetch afterwards. Uh, multiple block sizes. So most file systems have a fixed block size. The problem with the fixed block size is uh, for small files you'll, you'll end up using more space because you have to flip it in one block. If you use a really small uh, block size for your file system, the number of the amount of metadata that you need to maintain gets very high. So there, is, there has to be a trade-off between for the block sizes. So what the uh, AFS provides you is multiple block sizes. So it starts from 512 bytes all the way to uh, 128K. And the way it also does is it's very optimal. If your, uh, if your file size is less than 128K, it won't take 128K to store the file. So it's, it's a more efficient way of uh, doing things. The other good thing about it is uh, if you have a million files or if you have a, a, a 20 million files in a file system, it really does not matter how fast you go and do a stack on it. Uh, the way it is implemented is it uses an extensible hash structure and, and all you need to do is go find the hash and get the file information. Uh, we also have an optimization where the number of files uh, is less than one, one, uh, 1024, in that case a, a faster algorithm is used. Uh, so explicit I.O. So uh, since it's a modern file system, and, uh, it assigns, uh, it will assign priority to all kinds of I.O. So for example, you can have uh, reads, you can have writes, you can have scrub operations, you, you, you can have uh, asynchronous reads, you can have prefetch. Uh, what we do is we assign priorities to all of these kinds of I.O. and then based on, then we have an I.O. scheduler that will schedule these I.O.s in an optimal way. So this kind of uh, makes it uh, makes it very interesting, actually. Uh, since there is no volume manager involved, and uh, there is, uh, we, we have every knowledge of what the file is doing and what disk it resides in, and so we can do a much better job of uh, reordering re 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 I/O. So you can do much much more things because you have more knowledge of what is happening. Uh, 
the, the big thing for, for MySQL probably is it allows for uh, 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 concurrent writes. So what concurrent writes really means is uh, you, you have a file and multiple places are being updated. So you can actually do it in parallel. There is no one lock over the whole file to uh, make it one write at a time. Uh, this was like the famous uh, lock we used to call the single writer lock. And, for, for, and for finally, when you, uh, it allows you to use the write cache in a very safe way. Uh, when many file systems, they use the file cache, but when you actually do an F-sync, it's sent to the cache and it's not really put on disk. And if you have a power outage, the, the flash, uh, the cache is uh, now is volatile and it'll go away and you can miss some things. So what we do is after every uh, important write, for example, uh, when, when I say an important write is when you actually sync the transaction group or you actually do, do a synchronous write, we issue a, a command to flush this cache to disk. So we know for sure that the contents of the cache are on disk. So let's look at how uh, we implement uh, read and, and uh, a few things. So the basic idea is here is to give you folks an understanding of how the internals work so you can make a, a, a better choice when it comes. So when you do reads, ZFS uh, has multiple levels of cache. The primary cache is called an ARC. It's an adaptive replacement cache. You also have a secondary cache which can reside on an SD. So when you do a read, it will first check the primary cache. If it's not there, it will check the secondary cache. And if the secondary, it's not there in the secondary cache also, it will go to the disk and bring it for you. And while doing all of this, it will make, make sure it will see if you are doing an access pattern which can be prefetched and will prefetch things for you. These primary caches can be turned off and you can, uh, and I have more slides on, on those. So let's look at writes. So like I said, most in most file systems when you do a write, uh, when I say a write, uh, regular write, you're basically writing to memory. And after a while, uh, these writes in memory are sent to disk and synced. Uh, when we sync this, like I said, it's a copy and write and it's, it's very fast. So when you're writing stuff, you're basically writing at the, uh, at, at the speed of memory. There is also these writes which are at sync or which are uh, called uh, synchronous writes. So the, uh, the synchronous writes have to be very fast because uh, and they have to be on disk before your write call comes back. So in this case, we have this optimization call then, uh, this ZFS intent log, which is kind of a fast way to store this write onto disk. And uh, so what, what happens is you do a write, uh, synchronous write, it writes to the zill and it comes back. And, and after a while, while the whole transaction group syncs, the zill is cleaned up. Uh, and also the big benefit of using a ZIL is if you have multiple threads uh, which are issuing synchronous writes, all of these are aggregated in the ZIL and they're sent. So you could have four threads uh, while issuing uh, uh, one case synchronous writes. What the ZIL does is it uses a 4K block in one I.O. to send all of them through disk and it's really fast. Uh, you can also use a separate disk for the ZIL and, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. The one thing that people, when you say tuning, is they, when many people wrongly tell, turn off the ZIL. The ZIL has a very important role, and, and you should not turn, turn off the ZIL, unless you don't care about the consistency of your, uh, of your uh, DB. Uh, and so when we also do a write, we got to make sure that uh, the, the, if there's no single writer lock on the file. So what uh, this AFS does is it has an, an AVL tree of range locks. So, so each thread which when it tries to uh, write it gets a range lock and, and updates it. So what this allows is for multiple uh, writers to write to the same file at once. 
so I mentioned about the arc. So the full form for the arc is adaptive replacement uh, replacement cache. It was based off a paper which was uh, which is a few years old. So most uh, uh, caches can either are they have a fixed policy. They are most frequently used or most recently used. So what this algorithm does is it kind of maintains two two, uh, two hit counts. What's the hit count if I use most frequent uh, most frequently used? What's the hit count if I use most recently used? And then it will switch based on which hit count is good. Uh, so it, it happens automatically. So that's one nice thing about it. Uh, the R will cache the data from all the pools. It uh, uses all of mem memory to cache. So uh, if you are doing, if you are using ZFS and you see your free memory low, don't panic because as soon as there is a requirement for memory, the R will start freeing up. Uh, it, it also, this algorithm, the most switching between most frequently used and uh, most recently used will also will allow you to survive a full table scan. Uh, we have seen that uh, the ARC works best when you have a 64-bit kernel. This is because the ARC is in the kernel and then there's, uh, there's address space uh, limitations there. And also it works best if you have swap. Now let's look at how MySQL does I.O. Uh, the way the, the majority of the I.O. that's done at MySQL is done by the st storage engine. Different storage engines have different uh, methods of uh, doing I.O. So for example, if, you, if, you, if you're using my ISAM, it's, uh, what it does is it will cache only your keys and then it will ask the file system to cache the, uh, the, 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 the file. Uh, and also, uh, and, and I'll talk about InnoDB next. And also, when you ha when you're using a replication, you have this one file which is being which is being updated. Uh, uh, one file, uh, one thread reads and applies the pin log, and, and one thread is uh, is updating the pin log. So you can have various kinds of IOs that's happening. But uh, the most common trend is multiple readers doing a random IO a few writers doing uh, uh, sequential or random I.O. In the case of InnoDB, uh, the rates are issued by, by all the user threads. So if you have a thousand connections open to the DB and, and all of them are, are doing some query, you could see thousand threads issuing reads to disk. The writes are, are run by the, by the asynchronous threads, uh, you have th three threads in, in, in uh, 5.1, uh, one for the log writes, one for the uh, uh, data file writes, and one for the prefetch. Uh, with uh, 5.4, you can control how many threads you have. But the key point to note is writes are usually done by a, a fewer number of threads than reads. But the other important thing to note is uh, the reads can sometimes also cause writes. So what happens is if your if your InnoDB buffer is full and then you want to do a read, what you have to then do is flush one block out of the buffer before you do the write. So uh, that can get a little tricky. Uh, the other uh, source of writes is the InnoDB double <coughs> write buffer. So InnoDB has this concept where instead of updating the file straight away, it writes into this area called the trouble write before it writes to the main file. So um, that's another source of IOs. So now let's look at what are the best practices we, we have. So as with any best practices, you should always try it out on your workload before applying them. Uh, don't, don't think of it as uh, the last word. So the first thing we found was uh, you have multiple places where you can cache. You can either cache in the file system or you can cache inside InnoDB. What we found out is it's much better to cache inside InnoDB than inside uh, ZFS. The problem can happen is if uh, uh, is that the same block can, can exist both in the file system buffer as well as inside the InnoDB. 
So it's as if you're, uh, in, in the most extreme case, it's as if you have half the m memory because it's, it's being uh, stored in both the places. Uh, we also read some benchmarks to see what helps and we found uh, a, a quite a big improvement on uh, by storing it inside InnoDB. The key thing here is InnoDB knows what can be flushed and what, what needs to stay. And so in that way it can make a much more informed choice about uh, what needs to go. And since uh, the CFS has no idea about uh, what MySQL is doing, it's, it's harder for it to make a choice. Uh, I, I said that the R kind of grows and shrinks, but it's since we are, sorry, go ahead. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we only have that done in ODP. Uh, it's, it's the most popular story. And we were hoping to do more, but... But I can uh, compare those sort of benchmarks to other file system or uh, improvements against what exactly? So you say it's 7 to 100 percent improvement, so... Okay, so in one case, uh, we, we uh, it's in the same machine. You have let's say 16 gigs of memory and you give 14 gigs to InnoDB or you give 8 gigs to InnoDB and 6 to the R. So the comparison is there. Uh, uh, the R also has an option of, uh, of not caching anything or just the metadata. What we found was uh, if you let the R cache just the metadata it is much more beneficial. Uh, you can turn it off, but then you still, the metadata reads have to go to disk, so it's better to have it in the cache. The next spec pack, uh, the best practice is to match the record size. So as you know, an InnoDB page is uh, 16K in size, and if you're using the default 128K, when you have to uh, read one page, uh, you have to read the whole 128K. You have to read the whole 128K because everything is, uh, 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 you have to read it whole to verify if the contents are valid. So uh, what you end up doing is a whole lot of extra IOs when you do reads. Mm -hmm. The one more main reason to uh, match the record sizes is the read modify right. Let's say you just want to write 16K. So what you then have to do is you may have to read the whole 128K block if it's not there already and then modify only the 16K and write the 128K back. Uh, it's very easy to set the record size. So all you need to do is uh, type that command. So the important thing to note is uh, the record size takes an effect before the files are uh, created. So if you, if you have already files that are there, you need to uh, c c c copy them over, so it will take the new record size. So, uh, for the log and the... Bin. So, if you already had the file created, you just set the record size, copy them into the copy. That's it, yeah. So, the logs and the bin log, they're, they're what there is usually small <laughs> sequential writes, and for this, uh, using a 128K uh, record is the best way to go. The prefetch. So I mentioned about how intelligent the prefetch is, but unfortunately for MySQL, it doesn't really help that much. Uh, there are two kinds of prefetch. The uh, one is called the file level prefetch, which does all this forward, backward, etc. The standard. We also have this thing called the BDEV prefetch. The concept of a BDEV prefetch is you are already showing a 16K read to disk. Uh, the cost to read 16K versus the cost to read maybe 64K is roughly the same. Let's read 64K. Uh, the good news is we found that this helps, this hurts uh, uh, the database performance quite a bit and it has been turned off. So, for example, if you follow our, our advice and set the record size to 16K, this uh, beta prefetch will not happen. The the file level prefetch will also not happen if you uh, don't use the primary cache. So if you if, uh, if you uh, if, uh, if you set your primary cache to just cache metadata, the prefetch won't be uh, it won't happen. And InnoDB also has its own prefetch. 
So what you know, DB does is it has it uses these one mic extents and then tries to find out if you are uh, doing a, a, a sequential scan or a random scan. And if it is so, it'll it'll issue a prefetch requests for the for those also. We haven't seen them to be much of a problem as yet, but it should be easy to fix if we do find out that it's a problem. So that's something you need to be aware of. So I said uh, we have an I/O scheduler. So in the whole priority of uh, things, uh, every I/O has a priority, and it also has uh, a time by which it has at the time at which it originated. So uh, as the uh, uh, well as an I/O will age, the priority keeps increasing, and this can have problems sometimes when you are uh, doing a transaction sync to group. So you have a whole lot of stuff in. Um, memory that has been there for some time and is being sent to disk. So the, the writes of in, in this case will have a much higher uh, priority because they started way back in the past. So what happens is uh, the way we issue IOs is we try to keep a disk uh, 35 a queue full. So, at, so when you have writes the queue length is um, maximum is uh, 35 and when you have a transaction thing going on and uh, you have writes happening and you have this log write which needs to happen very fast then uh, it gets slower so uh, because you have to wait for one IO to complete and all that. So we have filed a bug on this and it will be uh, fixed soon. The, you'll, you'll, you, you will observe this phenomena if you see uh, periodic drops in your throughput. So. If you do see that, this is because of this bug and it will be fixed soon. Uh, you have multiple ways of choosing what sort of reliability you want. The most uh, performance way is to use uh, Stripe, which is RAID 0. You also can use mirroring. Uh, the other third option is RAID Z. Uh, unfortunately, RAID Z is not so good for random read performance. So you'll not be happy if you use the uh, AC. The, the best, so one of the main things your query actually waits when it's executing is to wait for an IO to complete. And for a regular disk, the wait for the IO can be maybe five milliseconds if you have a really fast disk. So what you can do with the L2 arc is you can use an SSD to cache these reads. And, uh, and SSDs are very fast, so the, the penalty of missing your uh, buffer pool is very less. You can have, based on how many IOs per query you do, you, you, you can have a multiple X improvement in throughput. Uh, it's very easy to add an L2 arc, so it's, uh, and it can be added online. There's no need to re-lay out the file system, etc. Uh, we usually prefer that you, you, you use an SSD as an L2 arc. Uh, but you could use uh, regular disks too, but using a disk won't give you many gain. What, what size SSD uh, do you uh, recommend for a level 2 arc? Uh, you can use any size, but basically what you want to do is find out what's the size of my DB and how much do I need cache. And, uh, is, is there a way to, is there information online to, to help you estimate what that should be? Uh, or is it trial and error? <laughs> The, I mean, the simplest way is to throw an LS on your uh, on, on, on your DB file and see the size and subtract it by how much you know DB buffer pool you have and so it should. The old formula used to be um, you tried to cache 10% of your data in memory. So, you know, if you, maybe you have a different access pattern and you want to cache more, the SSD kicks in, or maybe you haven't got enough memory, the SSD is going to help. So, I mean, uh, I'm a performance engineer, so one of the things we generally ask uh, when we interview somebody is if your buffer hit rate is 90% and by some way you're able to make it to 95%, what sort of performance increase will I see? And the answer is not 5%, it's more than 5%. So 
based on what hit rates you are, you'll see. Uh, uh, you'll see. The thing about L2 Arc is if you don't have, or if you cannot, uh, probably I should. You guys all work for big companies and a lot have a lot of money. But if you don't have money to <laughs> <laughs> cash your we whole have big data, not <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't have the SSDs to cash all of it, you could use an LTO R to uh, uh, get better performance. So. I also mentioned about the writes. So the writes uh, will go into the Zill, which is uh, the writes are very important. They're actually more important uh, because your query is waiting for it. You have your transaction may have issued. Your transaction may be committing and your threads are waiting for the for the acknowledgement. So it's very important that they be very fast. The best way to get really fast uh, writes is to not mix reads and writes. And uh, uh, reads and writes don't go along that well. Uh, I mean, you'll not get that high performance. The way you can uh, you can isolate your I/O is to actually use a separate pool for your logs, or you can use a zil. The problem with using a separate pool for your logs is you're, if you only have a fixed number of disks, you're taking away bandwidth from your main pool. So probably that's not such a good idea. But what you could do is you could use a zil, which uh, you could use you could use a separate intent log. The so separate intent log is usually an NVRAM card or it can be a write optimized SSD. Uh, I actually bought one for 800 bucks last year, so it's not really that expensive. So, but what it allows you to do is to get these writes really, really fast and that can improve your uh, performance. So uh, the most of these things hold true, uh, hold true, if, uh, hold true if, if your main bottleneck is I.O. If your bottleneck is CPU, then probably it's not going to be true. So I also mentioned about the cache flush. So what we have seen is many file systems actually don't, I don't, don't issue a, a flush at the end of your write. So it's when you are comparing AFS with other file systems, be sure that you, you understand this. Some compression. So you in AFS, I'm going to go a little faster because it's short of time. We have multiple algorithms to do uh, to compression. If, if it doesn't compress below 12.5 percent, it's not going to be used. Uh, the the problem with the compression is there's a cost associated with it, so you use more <laughs> CPU. But in many cases, the compressed uh, you get a better ratio of compression, so you can do a fewer I/O. So it's kind of uh, compensates for that. And for InnoDB, uh, if, I guess probably you all know that uh, the AFS is like a CB. It has a log. It has all of those things. So uh, some features are there in both the places. So you, you may want to choose which one you want. Uh, for example, uh, well, InnoDB provides a checksum and compression, but so does the AFS. But uh, the AFS actually self fails and won't crash. And the other best practice, and we got roughly 5% improvement, is to uh, turn off the NODP double write. That's safe. So we already mentioned about snapshots, how it's so cool and everything. I'm going to skip this. So we applied some of our best practices to our uh, to our benchmark. So just remember, this benchmark is, is, is a micro benchmark. It may not translate into what you see with your applications. So basically, the two big boosts we get are by tuning the record size and turning off the cache flush. So about the cache flush, be very careful. If you don't have a battery back flush uh, cache, don't turn it off. It's better to get, l it's don't turn it off. And also by caching only the metadata, we got a slight improvement. The, probably the important thing you guys need to know is the copy on write. So if you have a workload which is mainly OLTP and then at the end of the day you do some, uh, uh, you, you, you do full table scans. So with, with the copy and write, when you write, the, it changes the physical order of the files. So the next time you go and you want to do a full table scan, what used to be a sequential I.O. now becomes a random I.O. And that can be a problem. So we actually did uh, a one week of tests to see how much of a problem it is. So we ran an OLTP search bench for one hour and at the end of an hour we do a select count star and 
So as you can see, with time, the copy on penalty gets more and more, and you need to be aware of it. I mean, for our benchmark, it was around 25%. It can be more for, uh, for your workload, but that's something to be aware of. But the solution for this is, uh, well, simple according to me. You, you just need to copy the file over to a new place, and then you have the whole sequential file. We also have an, an idea to uh, get rid of the copy on write for penalty. Uh, it will probably take a while before it's fixed, but uh, don't wait for it. But, the, the, uh, but with, with SSDs, this penalty is not there because the random I.O. is as good as sequential I.O. So just a few misconceptions or probably things you have. I've heard people commonly say ZFS needs more RAM. That's not true. We use one byte to cache one byte. ZFS uh, needs more CPU. That is somewhat true. Uh, well, then we, all, we also provide so many more features than, than other players, right? And for if you are all, if you if your workload is 100% CPU bound, you will actually not benefit from ZFS. But many customers don't run at 100%, so you can uh, you can use a few more percentage of your processor to So for more information, we, we try to, we have this one place where you can find all the information. It's called the best practices guide. Uh, it's our opinion that tuning is evil but it's required, so we call it the evil tuning guide. Uh, most of the things I said about how to turn off the caches, etc., is all there and there. Uh, we also blog, uh, blog about it quite a bit, and it, since it's open source, there's a mailing list where you can ask more questions. So that's pretty much it. Any questions? So is there been any thought to, I mean, and, and what would you do if you wanted to write a nice cross storage engine? So uh, there has been quite a bit of thought about it, and uh, it, it is true that uh, if you look at I/O, right, the whole uh, POSIX layer is just another layered on top of I/O, on top of the architecture that we have. So it's, we have a well-defined architecture that you could write it, but uh, we haven't had any chance to do it. So, uh, I said 100%, this is to say your fetch may not be a good fit. What is the minimum percentage where it could be a fetch? Is that, uh, uh, is that the question? Or? So I estimate the ZFS to add somewhere between 5 to 10 percent more overhead. Ah, so okay. if you are at 50, your utilization will be 55, but if you are at 90, you'll go to 100. So. It, it's also dependent a little bit because I did a test with a workload that got used in the, the 5.4 announcement, which was on UFS. I put it on ZFS, and actually it, it ran. There was no throughput penalty at all. And uh, the uh, CPU utilization was about the same. And when I started applying some of the best practices, I actually got CPU back ahead of what I had before. So it's going to depend on your workload. If you've got a very I/O intensive workload, you will, you'll have more of a hit. Um, if you've got just a reasonable mix of I/O and a lot of CPU primarily, you may not even notice a difference. Is this slide deck uh, available? Yeah, I will post it online. It's not yet available, but I'll put it. Someone asked this question before, and I'm not sure you answered it. Do any, did any of your tests compare this this benchmark throughput wise with other languages? No, we haven't. What about XFS? How you can compare ZFX? 
uh, we haven't done any comparisons. So. Because I'm looking online and sort of interested information, of course, I'm sure you would be interested too. <laughs> sure. So, I mean, this is just the beginning. We, we do plan to do comparisons with the, with the DXC3 and, and probably XFS, but probably mainly with DXC3. So, I'll, I'll blog about it when it's done. So. You recommend to put the uh, Indian Blocks in a different tool uh, than the main files, the data files. But if I do that, uh, I cannot do consistent snapshots anymore, is that right? Since uh, if I want to use snapshots for backup, um, I want to screw my data and you have a different tools. Uh, you can take snapshots of uh, different file systems, but they have to happen one after the other. Uh, in this case, probably what you would have to do is to quieten the DB so you're not doing any I.O. Take the snapshot and then do it. We also have a bug that's filed where you can actually snapshot multiple file systems in one in one go. Uh, but yeah, the in the case is helpful. Yeah, but I mean the, the the thing about putting the logs on a separate desk is uh, you can consider using a Zill, a slog, for example, a, a separate intent log. Any more questions?